I V M. Hey guys, IVM podcast is turning seven. Can you believe it? It's been a pretty awesome journey for us with these wonderful folks, and I can't wait to see what the next seven years bring. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello, and welcome to All Things Policy. I'm Manoj Kevaramani, and today it is my pleasure to host Mr. Sudeep Chakravarti for this very special conversation. Sudeep is an award-winning author of several best-selling works of history, ethnography, politics, and conflict resolution. Today, we'll be talking about his new book, *The Eastern Gate: War and Peace in Nagaland, Manipur, and India's Far East*. To me, when I read the book, it sort of touches upon each of those disciplines that I've mentioned uh, earlier, uh, and we'll try and touch upon all of those in the conversation, along with another discipline which I think is not mentioned earlier, which is journalism, because this is an interesting narrative style style that Sudeep has chosen in the book, and we'll sort of get to all of that. But first, Sudeep. Welcome to All Things Policy, and thank you for doing this with us. My pleasure, Manoj. It's an, always a pleasure to be associated with this uh, podcast and anything to do with Takshashila. Awesome. So, I want to begin with a question, sort of stepping away from the actual subject matter, and just sort of start with, uh, and it's a sort of a cliche question. Firstly, why did you choose to write about this subject, and why now? And along with that, I want to add a question about the narrative style that I mentioned. Um, you've chosen a non-linear uh, narrative style, so it's not like it's a linear sto- storytelling of you know when things started and where things are today. You go back and forth in the narrative, and there is also a sort of journalistic narrative style where you've got dispatches in between, which is really great for a reader. Uh, you suddenly get sort of an insight into what you were thinking and how you sort of conceptualize something that's been going on. And there are these little snippets of your own views uh, where you're in, in interviews, in conversations with different people. And so in that sense, you know, you're also part of the story. So I wanted to get your first thought on the narrative style and also the subject. Well, the subject, Manoj, came to me quite organically, to use an overused word. Uh, Because, I mean, I have chosen in these past 15 to 20 years, really, to focus on issues, places, and people which have typically almost dropped off the map, if you will, from the sort of the mainland Indian narrative or what I would like to call that these are away from the mall stupor of India. It's a cynical way I sometimes like to describe it. So I I thought that it is interesting when India is such a, in in a dynamic stage uh, of its evolution, when the economy has been doing uproariously well, of course, not for the past couple of years, or four years on account of a slowdown, on account of various reasons, but generally it's this booming, go-getting, sort of world-grabbing, power-hungry, even, to some extent, behemoth of a country, seething, heaving country that wants to take charge and be counted on the global power table, right? But within that, I mean, you have a situation where there are hundreds of millions of people who are simply not invited to the party on account of socioeconomic disparity um, or poverty, to use a very simple word, and also on account of being, on account of feeling and literally being away from the party because of ignorance or arrogance or apathy of those who choose or, or those who presume to govern in their name, i.e. New Delhi, to put it bluntly, looking outward at various quadrants of India in this particular place that is bizarrely described as northeast. It is only north of Chennai or Bengaluru or Mysore or Hyderabad or maybe Bhubaneswar, but it's sort of due east. I mean, for them, Delhi is to the northwest, so I don't know where they got that directional you know, description in the first place, but uh, we'll maybe talk about it in, at another time. But I think one of the, the reason I'm, I bring this up also in jest, but definitely to make a point, is that even the naming of the region by this grand bureaucratic construct of this paternalistic Indian government from the midnight hour of 1947 inherited seamlessly from the British system of governance, decided to designate this region of nearly 50 million people and one seventh of India's landmass as northeast when it's really India's far east. And so there was a disconnect which came about uh, with partition, where one day you could travel seamlessly from Kolkata to Agartala and Tripura. You could go seamlessly in the waterway from the Ganga 
from the Bay of Bengal right up to Guwahati through the inland waterways of present-day Bangladesh. And overnight, because of partition, you have this great fist of present-day Bangladesh, East Pakistan and now Bangladesh, thrust into a seamless British Indian Empire and a seamless subcontinent, if you will. And all that remained was this little thing that we call the chicken's neck, which is a silicone, narrow, narrow silicone corridor, which on a clear day, you can stand at the northwestern tip of Bangladesh and see the southeastern tip of Nepal. And it is so close, it is so narrow, and that is the only land link we have with this place that New Delhi and India's policy dons called the northeast of India. And that's now become part of our discourse. So it's been a very physical disconnect, Manoj, uh, from 1947, where we were cut off. It, there was no seamless transportation, there was no seamless travel, there was no seamless commerce. Life had ground to a halt when earlier it was a it was a terrific commercial, entrepreneurial, people movement specific region. It was one of the most fertile, commercially viable and wealthy regions of Asia. So from then to be cut off, I think came to the first disconnect. And then a successive governments have we can talk about that a little later. But I just thought I'd give this a curtain raiser to just justify why I'm doing this because of disconnects from it. That when you people feel disconnected and then they see uh, uh, official policy being thrust upon them for the sake of Indian integration without explaining what that integration entails and what it means, uh, people justifiably might feel, and this is a region where there are several hundred languages and dialects, several hundred tribes, several major religions. You name it, it is there. And you know, in a region of this diversity, which actually trumps in many ways even Indian diversity, where for the rest of India, you could allow linguistic states, you could allow demographics to rule how India would come to be, how India would come to evolve. You did all of that for Tamil Nadu, for Maharashtra, for Gujarat, for the so-called cow bells, for Bengal, Orissa, everywhere demographically, ethnographically, linguistically. But when it came to the Northeast, we just assumed they didn't know any better, that their sense of identity and need, linguistic and cultural and ethnographic links and cultural links and economic needs and needs of dignity and identity were not worth the taking. Because as, you know, uh, when people were talking about uh, in the Nagas and the other ethnicities in the Northeast of India, including those in Assam, we're talking about a sense of identity and a sense of self before a sense of nation and a sense of country. Uh, in the years of formation of India, Mr. Nehru and his cabinet colleagues in a somewhat paranoid way decided, and I paraphrase Mr. Nehru here, he actually wrote this and said this in parliament uh, during a debate, that you know, how can we leave these people to themselves in a region where you have Myanmar and you have China? I mean, he was, and you have Pakistan. So here is a region which to its west and its south had East Pakistan and now Bangladesh, to its north and east had northeast had China, the great bulk of China, bulge of China, and to its east and southeast had Myanmar. So Mr. Nehru was thinking in a very geopolitical manner in that sense, and felt that India had to take absolute control of this region for the moment, for nation building exercises and nation building purposes, and they would look at people aspirations later. I think that led to a fatal flaw in the whole process, in, in the perception how the Northeastern Indian people began to view India and how India began to view the Northeast from India looking eastwards, northeastwards in a very paternalistic manner, and from the Northeast looking westwards towards New Delhi and what they call mainland India very derogatively uh, as, a, as a sort of, uh, you know, they, all they want to do is dominate us. They don't really care. All they want to do is impose. So now that gave birth to many people's movements which were not understood or deliberately misunderstood. And that gave way to rebellions and that gave way to violence, which and have endured all across Northeast of India from 1948-49 up until this present day, Manoj. It's a yeah. tragedy. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And I, I wanted to sort of add on to some of the things that you were talking about, that there is, uh, you know, there was obviously a misunderstanding and that misunderstanding seems to persist uh, and it's there for many reasons in terms of the complexity of the region. I mean, from my point of view also, you know, one of the things that struck me when I was reading the book is that there is such tremendous diversity uh, in that part of the country. Mm -hmm. And it's incredible how in our public narrative and public discourse, the Northeast sort of club together 
which completely, I mean, forget just there being diversity in the fact that there, are, there is more than one state over there. It's just that there are so many different, like you said, ethnicities, tribes, lands, uh, there's religious diversity. And uh, also territory and land is such a critical aspect of people's lives. It's so intrinsically linked to their identity, which is very different from, say, uh, lives that, say, a, you know, like you described, a modern Indian living in the mainland of India would be, you know, somebody who's upwardly mobile, who probably be, having lived in three, four cities in their career mm-hmm. uh, and having been traveled mm-hmm. across the year. You know, so it's such a very different sort of existence in that way. Uh, and there's such a lack of understanding also, of, you know, how that difference is so intrinsic to identity and why that also fuels conflict. So I wanted to add, uh, and I want you to give us a broad sweep of what are the different types of conflicts? What are the different sort of drivers of conflicts in yeah. each different state? Because there are very different drivers of conflicts. In mm-hmm. some cases, there is, misgovernance in some cases there is identity and i also want you to sort of uh, and you i think you did sort of when you were talking about uh, you know nehru and uh, india's early policy the indian state's early policy mm-hmm. how much of this mm-hmm. is sort of also philosophically a product of uh, you know the idea of this old system of frontiers giving way to the creation of modern mm-hmm. nation states mm-hmm. with rigid boundaries mm-hmm. and those boundaries being this sort of sacrosanct entities that you can't shift all right, Manoj, you've asked a series of uh, very interesting questions, and thank you for this, because, you know, that's exactly the kind of questions we need to ask, and hopefully I'll be able to provide some of the answers, or at least some clarity, if not answers per se. Because here, the lack of clarity, Manoj, is really the reason where, uh, which has led to this desperate need for answers. Clarity and answers are not always the same thing, because clarity is clarity, and answers could be you know, answer, you may be looking for the answers which are tailor-made for your needs. So I would stress on clarity here. Let me I mean, just begin with a broad brush, and I'll begin by just touching upon one remark that you made about, you know, the sort of cosmopolitan, well-traveled, upwardly mobile India. Let me assure you, and to you, to our listeners today, that in northeastern India, which is for the mainland Indians is totally out of sight, and out of mind of literally the Wild East, there are hundreds of thousands of upwardly mobile, millions of upwardly mobile people who have traveled all across the Northeast and all across mainland India. They have a much better idea uh, about mainland India than many mainland Indians do about the mainland India. So that's one particular thing. So we, when I say we, I'm using this grand B to describe the mainland Indian, have a sort of a preconceived idea about those in, uh, in, in Sikkim and Assam, in Arunachal Pradesh, in Meghalaya, in um, Nagaland, in Manipur, in Tripura, in Mizoram. I'm brought in a broad brush mention, mentioning the, the, the eight states of the Northeast, right? But our brothers and sisters in these states are acutely aware, not just of where they're located within the Republic of India, but they're far more aware of being located in a geopolitical sweet spot, which to my mind rivals the much Trump geopolitical sweet spot in India's Northwest, which is the Afpar sweet spot, which is Tibet and all that. But let's remember that India's Northeast too has Tibet. India's Northeast too has Southwest and China, Tibet an autonomous region. It too has, it has Bhutan, which doesn't, it doesn't exist. There. It has Nepal, it has, Bangladesh, which uh, for several decades up until 1971, was uh, what Indians love to call an enemy territory. It was Pakistan. It was an adjunct of Pakistan, the most populous uh, adjunct of Pakistan. You have Myanmar to the east. Your entire Lukis policy and Actis policy is predicated on the northeast of India acting as both a gateway and a bridgehead and a link. So, you know, they're very aware from Guwahati, uh, uh, Manoj, uh, you know, as the as a Sukhoi 30 might fly, the, you know, Lhasa is what? Is it 15 minute supersonic burn or, you know, or 20 minutes max, maximum? Uh, Kunming is what? An hour and a half away, right? Guwahati to Dhaka would be flown in 10 minutes on afterburner or less. You know, so these are the things that, you know, these are the regional dynamics which we in peninsular India or subcontinental India are not always aware, and I think uh, have not been aware for a long time till we got kicked on our backside by Myanmar in part, by East Pakistan in part, by China in great part. And then suddenly you have the Eastern Command waking up. Suddenly you have the Ministry of 
development of northeastern region waking up. Suddenly you have battalions of cabinet ministers and senior ministers and prime minister and the home minister and the defense minister trooping northeastwards every time there's an election, including the latest one we had, which concluded uh, just hours ago, just days ago in Manipur, as you and I speak. So I mean, the, the dynamics are beginning to change. The, the awareness is being beginning to change in terms of the Northeast of India's strategic location in, in what it can do and what it means for India. But I, I, I unfortunately, I mean, it just, so it ha it's happened. It, it's not just that this administration has brought it in. And it's not just, not that Mr. Nehru, uh, even though I sort of uh, criticized him in the beginning, I did contextualize the criticism in the sense that that was the time when there was a vast amount of nation building happening. There was also the time then Hyderabad was being coerced by Mr. Patel to become part of Republic of India. Nobody talks about that. Uh, and, and Junagar and you know various states of Northwestern India, the project to become part of India. Similar things were happening in the Northeast, but I think because of the complexity of the Northeast. I mean, Hyderabad was, is in peninsular India. Where will it go? It can't go into the Bay of Bengal, right? But in the Northeast of India, you had China you could go to, you had East Pakistan. Pakistan that was happy to help your regional aspiration. You had Myanmar that provided shelter to militants and rebels and has done so for decades. So the dynamic was different, the geography was different, and even the same rules applied to the Northeast had different outcomes uh, because of various various factors. So this is the broad suit. For instance, in, in, in Assam, the trouble was about how there was a successive governments from the 60s and 70s and uh, onwards did not pay heed to the massive amounts of migration that happened from mainland India and also from Bangladesh as a result of the 1965 war and then subsequent to that 1971, when there was conflict. The same way that Calcutta, Kolkata was swamped and Bengal was swamped, Assam was also swamped, Tripura was swamped. Its entire demographics changed from a Tripuri identity to an entirely Bengali identity simply on account of migration. So, you know, there were these dynamics playing. So in Assam, this Bengali dynamics, this Bengali influx, this sort of some, the Muslim Bengali influx played a huge, huge role in the feeling of dampening the Ahomia identity, the Ahom identity, the mainstream, the, the majoritarian Assamese identity in, in Assam, which then began with students' movements in the late 70s and 80s, which then uh, took this horrific, turn with uh, these genocidal incidents like the Nelly massacre in 1983, when hundreds of men, women, and children were butchered in Assam. And then suddenly the world woke up and said, oh my God, what's happened? Where did we go wrong? You know, what can we do? Too late. By the time, you know, salves were applied, as the, this, this sort of uh, students' movement and this sort of very, very angry public response morphed into uh, what later became the United Liberation Front of Assam or Ahom. The, the rebellion, which uh, one faction of it continues to this day. And so you had that. And then, of course, there was an irony here as well. And I'll come to that later when I explain as to how some of the Northeastern states are themselves responsible for creating trouble within the Northeast. Assam is a prime culprit in that. We'll talk about that in a, in a, in a few minutes, I hope. Uh, and then if you look to Arunachal Pradesh, it was almost like a you know, fief of, of the government of India simply because of its location along the rim of south, southern, southwestern China and north and southeastern Tibet, now the Tibetan Autonomous Region. So late 50s and Panchila or the lack of it or the collapse and the 1962 war and subsequent troubles and Galwan and the Arunachal Pradesh issues and border skirmishes and contentious visa stamping and you know all the, you know, I don't want to go over old ground, but all that has led to the recognition that Arunachal Pradesh is crucial to the well-being of uh, this sort of boundary, as you brought up, this sort of country's boundary as opposed to regional boundaries. So you have SUMK30I bases in Assam pointing outwards north and northeast and southeast towards China and Myanmar. You have missile emplacements looking at these regions as well. Eastern Command, which is based out of Fort William in Kolkata, has taken on huge significance in the past 20 years and it will get increasingly more crucial and more important in India's geopolitical dynamics because it looks through the Northeast and onto China, Myanmar, and so on and so forth to secure uh, India's borders and Bangladesh. So Arunachal has 
face this sort of overwhelming paternalism, if you will, of Indian states. It has benefited from nice roads to some extent, nice bridges, and even the name, for heaven's sake, Manoj, Arunachal Pradesh. It's about as paternalistic and Sanskritized a name for a state of India, province of India, which has nothing to do with anything. It was, you know, it was like the almost like a Mahabharat project, like Meghalaya. I mean, what led to it being given a Sanskrit name, the abode of the clouds? The Meghalaya people, the Khasis, Garos, and Jaintias, and the Ward Jaintia, and the Kiwar, and the, you know, they have perfectly good names for their regions. Why not take it uh, to? I mean, you have Nagaland, for instance. So why not have something? So, you know, th there were these impulses that emanated from New Delhi primarily and over successive generations of Indian politicians, policymakers, policy dons and bureaucrats, mm. you know, the worst of the worst in this particular case, which has led to alienation. In Nagaland, what they wanted was basically uh, when, when India transitioned from British India to Indian India, if you will, uh, or India of its own, then you, the Nagas made a representation to the Simon Commission, which was not accepted by the Simon Commission or the British Indian Empire at the time. But they did make a representation that, you know, we'd like to be like you left us alone simply because you found us ungovernable to some extent. Mm -hmm. You know, we would like to continue to be left alone. And then that morphed later into the Naga hardline position and then the Naga rebel position that we want autonomy because we want to be left alone. It was simply a attitudinal, behavioral, position of British India that transformed into a demand to be left alone by the Republic of India. Now, as far as India was concerned, it completely inherited British Indian policies and practices. So where it applied the same paternalism as the Crown government did to the Northeast and to the Naga Hills, for instance, in the Naga tribes uh, of, of the time. And But it took it too far. And then the paranoia of Mr. Nehru and his cabinet colleagues come, comes in in this government formation period or this formation of country, formation of India as we know it today, the delineation of the boundaries, the, the firming up of the boundaries, the lines of partition, which are beginning to be firmed up and preserved and protected and claimed by India as its very own. And in order to do that, it went and sent in the uh, Assam Home Guards and then it sent in armed police and then it sent in the Indian Army. And you had genocidal proportions of war on people, burning, maiming, killing, raping, you name it, Manoj, these are very tragic spots in our, in our history, which we now, in our 75th year of independence, we must have the maturity to own up to, acknowledge, accept, remedy, and move on. So I, if you burn, maim, kill your own people for yeah. the sake of inclusion, then it's yeah. a contradiction in terms. Same yeah. thing happened in Manipur. The same thing happened in Mizoram. The same yeah. thing happened in Tripura to a great extent. So, you know, we have to move beyond these. We have to move beyond these assumptions and presumptions that yeah. we've imposed upon our brothers and sisters of so-called Northeastern India, yeah. which I'd rather call Far Eastern India, and, and truly interact with them, listen to them, embrace them, and localize policies and re localize responses to suit each regional need. I'm going to, I'm going to come to this uh, towards the end of our conversation. Uh, but I'm going to take a quick break uh, at present and, uh, you know, uh, we take a quick break and then we'll come back and join the conversation. But I want to ask you a little bit more about the demand by the Nagas and why that has been. So you've laid out the history, but I want to sort of also get into why that demand has been difficult to actually, you know, address in practice because of just geography, because of the, the policies of the Indian uh, administrations uh, successively over the decades. Uh, and we'll get to that after this quick break. We face a hundred dilemmas every day while raising our children and nurturing our families. Why not let science help us make informed decisions to solve our dilemmas? Hi, I'm Devi Shobha. And I'm Meghna. We host Big Talk About Tiny Humans, where we will help you unpack challenges around parenting and your child's development. And more importantly, we will equip you with research-backed strategies that you can readily act on. Tune in to our podcast every Wednesday on the IBM Podcasts app, website, or your favorite podcast platforms. Hello and welcome back to All Things Policy. I'm Manoj Kevadramani and I'm in conversation with Sudeep Chakravarti about his new book, The Eastern Gate. Before the break, uh, we were talking about, you know, uh, 
the issues that the Indian state has had in terms of its handling of, uh, you know, conflicts and disputes uh, in India's Far East, uh, popularly known as India's Northeast. Uh, and we've, we've been talking, uh, Sudhir had given us a broad overview of what are the sort of different issues and how they interlink with each other. And we're going to be talking right now about the uh, issues related to this demand for, you know, this greater Nagaland uh, and, you know, why that's such a difficult thing and why that's been so difficult. So we talked about, you know, different issues in terms of how the Indian state over the decades, you know, has used, uh, you know, horrific excessive force, how there has been a case where we've misunderstood the actual challenges and the actual uh, desires and needs. We've also even imposed names, like to be pointed out, uh, you know, sensitized names to these states uh, without taking into account actually what the people over there think. Um, so I wanted to come to this issue uh, about this demand for, uh, you know, as broad Nagaland. And you sort of lay this out in the book when you talk about the, the situation in Manipur uh, as to, there have been attempts at ceasefires, yet the, the, the ceasefire attempt has not really succeeded. And it's complicated because when you announce a ceasefire, there are anyway so many different groups. So whom are you really announcing a ceasefire with and how that impacts on other groups? Also, what does the what is the territory that a ceasefire entails? It was a really strange ceasefire that was announced uh, also. So I wanted to sort of tell us a little bit more about that. Okay, so uh, thank you very much because you've actually now made me hyper jump or will make me hyper jump into the meat of the issue. And actually, this is the crucial aspect because it sort of describes the complexity of this region, northeastern India, and it also highlights the complexity of the so-called Naga issue or the Naga problem, which is actually an Indian problem or a creation of India's making to which the Naga rebel leadership or the Naga elders of the time also contributed because it was not always a situation of conflict. There was a situation of negotiation. Let's remember also that for all the paranoia that we've ascribed to Mr. Nehru and his cabinet colleagues, he did engage several times with the Naga, the Council of Naga elders and the future rebel leaders like Mr. Angami Zapu Fizo, uh, Zapu Fizo for short, who headed uh, the Naga National Council, uh, for instance, which went into the full-blown rebel movement in short order. Now, Mr. Nehru, whenever he campaigned from the first uh, Indian parliamentary elections for which he traveled to Assam and other parts of the Northeast, he took time to meet the Naga uh, Council leadership to talk about how they could come to uh, a solution to this. So it wasn't like it was always a battle from the word go, they were talking. Mr. Nehru and Mr. Nehwin, who was the Burmese chief of the time, Myanmar chief, they actually went to Kohima, the present day capital of Nagaland, and then the district, uh, had, I mean, the, the, head, uh, the headquarters of the, the Naga Hills district, uh, to, to meet with uh, Naga elders of the time. They were treated poorly. And, and the, the urban legend goes that the outraged Naga elders lifted, turned their backs on Mr. Nehru and lifted their, their loincloths and mooned Mr. Nehru and Mr. Nehru was so aghast and so appalled to be insulted in front of his Burmese counterpart that he went back and promptly set the Indian army in. Now, that's a bit of a stretch, but yes, there is some truth to uh, Mr. Nehru feeling utterly paranoid about Naga aspiration at the time. Now, the, the thing is that they really wanted uh, an identity issue to be sorted out. Uh, they wanted dignity. They wanted recognition, which India finally gave them in 1963 when as a part of a peace process in 1960, Nagaland actually became a full-fledged Indian state in 1963, nearly a decade before uh, Manipur got that status of a full-fledged A state of India, uh, nearly a decade before Meghalaya was born, was hived away from Assam, a full two decades before and more before Mizoram became a full-fledged state of India in 1986. So Nagaland got there first, but there's a story to it because the, the peace process in 1960, after years of horrific, there's no getting around that genocidal acts by the Indian army and its adjuncts and security establishment towards the Nagas. There, there was a sort of a peace process in the 1960, in 1960, which translated to the birth of Nagaland in 1963. But there was a, there was a group of people uh, of rebel leadership of the time who felt that, you know, it wasn't fair that the true blue autonomy and true blue respect and dignity did, were not accorded to the Naga people. So they quickly broke into a sort of two groups. One was the accordist group and a non-accordist group, which then grew into the, uh, you know, another rebel movement. And then that, that led to another peace uh, deal, the Shillong Accord in 1975, 
which were disagreed upon by another crop of rebel leadership, which then uh, evolved into the largest Naga rebel conglomerate of the present day, the National Socialist Council of Naga Lim, Isaac Muiva, named after the two leaders. Mr. Isaac uh, Chishisu is passed, but Mr. Twingaleng Muiva is still with us. So the M of the IM is now the leading uh, sort of uh, negotiator with the Republic of India for conclusive peace. Now the problem, Manoj and, and listeners, is that Naga land, when you talk about Naga homeland, when you talk about bringing dignity to the Naga people, it immediately becomes complex because the Naga people in the territory of India, in territorial India, are primarily in Naga land, the geographical and political territorial state of Naga land, which came into, which was birthed in 1963. But there are contiguous Naga homelands in two southeastern districts of Arunachal Pradesh, Tirap and Changlang, which border Myanmar, absolute tip of northwestern Myanmar. Then you have contiguous Naga homelands also in southeastern Assam, which borders Nagaland, the, the Karbi Anglong area of Nagaland, just north of Kachar, north of Silchar, and all that. And then you have the northern aspect of Manipur, nearly a half of Manipur, the northern half, the, the hilly half of northern half of Manipur, which are traditional Naga homelands, also contiguous homelands. So when you uh, take the demand of Naga homelands and you know, uh, this greater Naga land, which also, amazingly enough, includes homelands of the Naga people in present-day Myanmar, which were separated politically and territorially on account of partition and account, on account of border delineation between Myanmar and India, Burma and India uh, in, in the 1940s. So it is an amazingly complex cocktail of Naga homelands, which are divided into two different countries and into four distinct different states of India, Nagaland being the primary of them. Now, when you talk about peace with the Naga people, the rebellions of the Naga people were not limited by territorial Nagaland. The same way that the Maoist rebellion in central India is not limited by Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, and Orissa, and Bihar, and Madhya Pradesh, and Uttar Pradesh. I mean, the rebels move across state boundaries. So the Naga rebellion moved across these four states and also found refuge in Myanmar, where one of the major factions, uh, NSCN's Kaplang faction, was located for the longest time, is still located in part uh, in, in Myanmar. So when you say ceasefire, ceasefire where? And with whom exactly? Because you're talking about ceasefire across two countries, two separate central governments need to agree, two separate security establishments in Myanmar and India need to agree, more you know, in a more complex manner, if that was not complex enough, the people or the chief ministers of the states or the bureaucracy or the politicians and the people of Assam, Manipur and Arunachal also need to agree because meanwhile, they are also distinct states with very, with very, very delineate, very sharp territorial boundaries. So they don't want to lose seed territory to this grand Naga homeland project. So when, so when, when in 1997, the government of India signed a ceasefire agreement with the National Socialist Council of, of Nagalim, Isaac Muiva, in 1997, by then, NSCN had split into its two factions, IM and K, which is K for Kaplan. And, uh, you know, I, I, I remember I was in Zurich, uh, in Davos, actually accompanying the delegation of Prime Minister Ishi Devi Gauda. And the entire IM leadership, we were coming back from Davos to Zurich to fly off to Mauritius, where Mr. David Gauda was headed to next. And we met, they stopped outside this uh, forest area, suburb of Zurich, where the Naga leadership met uh, Prime Minister David Gauda to actually solidify a, a peace process that was begun by his predecessor, Mr. Twice Over, uh, Mr. P.V. Narasimha Rao, who actually initiated the Naga peace process. The first talks with NNC and IM happened with Mr. Rao. So, you know, so it is, it is a process that has been with us from the mid 90s, Manoj, and then 1997. And then when Mr. Gujral was a prime minister, I.K. Gujral, the ceasefire agreement was actually signed. But what was the ceasefire agreement? The ceasefire agreement was signed vaguely uh, in the sense that it was, said, it, it was signed between NSA and IM. Now, when Mr. Vajpayee, Atul Bihari Vajpayee, became prime minister in 1998 and then 1999, and then in 2001, 
in, during a peace talks, the peace, uh, the interlocutor of the time decided that to made an announcement that the peace process, the ceasefire would now extend without territorial limits. There was chaos, Manoj, there was mayhem. Manipur erupted because when you say without territorial limits, you are essentially saying that uh, you are hinting in the Naga mind or in the Manipuri mind, the Assamese mind, and the Arunachali mind, you're hinting at greater Naga land. Because then you're saying there is territorial, without territorial limits across Naga land, across Manipur, the Naga homelands in Manipur, in Assam, in Arunachal Pradesh, and you're essentially presaging a Naga, greater Naga land by default. Like you're, it's like a done deal. So Manipur erupted. The citizens of Manipur in Imphal Valley and elsewhere, the majoritarian Methi population, the non-Naga people went ballistic. They torched. Uh, vehicles, they burned down government buildings. There was mayhem. People were shot at. People died. They became the nationalistic martyrs. Were uh, you know were worshipped every year on that particular day in June when the, the movements erupted. So hastily, the government of India backtracked and said, "No, the the ceasefire would extend to Nagaland." Now, what does it mean? That you know the rebel groups in IM and K and NSM Haplang signed a ceasefire with government of India a few years later in 2001, the same year that this thing whole thing blew up. So there's this bizarre ceasefire in place, where the ceasefire is in place in territorial Naga land, but in technical terms, the ceasefire does not exist in other areas, other Naga homelands. So technically, there is no ceasefire in Assam, Manipur, and Arunachal Pradesh. So here, the Indian Army, Assam Rifles, and the Naga Rebels sort of tiptoe around each other. They do it for goodwill. This is where the most violent incidents and breach of ceasefire have also happened, with both sides claiming, hey, you know, make up your mind. There is no ceasefire. Or is there a ceasefire? If there is, so one side keeps pushing the other, and the other side pushes it back. So it's become this sort of, dance of death, this bizarre ceasefire, where Manoj, the government of India, is also responsible for another great, great like lack of judgment, which has come to a sorry pass. Because in order to manage the conflict, in order to keep it within manageable limits, which is a tried and tested and utterly failed construct, in my opinion, a security approach of the government of India, which prefers Chanakya Niti, you know, they've done hate the sort of divide and rule aspect rather than trying to solve something. So it has always been the mantra of managing conflict. What is managing conflict? Let the Naga rebels, NSN, IM, and all other Naga factions run parallel administrations for the sake of ceasefire, for the sake of peace talks. So even as you and I speak and our listeners listen in, today, when there is a comprehensive framework agreement for peace signed by no lesser self-professed administrative genius like Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his cohort of self-professedly brilliant you know, administrators and policymakers in the entire global history of you know, this, this blessed earth. They, this, this bizarre ceasefire continues where NSA and IM, NSA and the various factions of NSA, and which are now eight or nine as we speak, can continue to recruit, can continue to train their cadres. They can, they can, and they do continue to arm themselves. They continue to run parallel administrations which impinges, impinges on politics, on the administration, on elections, you name it, to the extent that the Naga people for decades on end, for the sake of these national workers, as the rebels like to call themselves, have had to pay a tithe, which is not 10%. Sometimes it's 25%, so technically it's not a tithe. But it's 25% where, uh, or 10%, the auto rickshaw drivers, the vegetable sellers, the sellers, the car dealerships, you name it, have to pay in money to the rebel groups in order for, it's basically a protection racket for the national cause. And the government of India has permitted this for decades, Manish. It's a scandal, which we still have not addressed. So, you know, you have, it, it's so bizarre that here we take this hoity toity, highfalutin, moral ground uh, aspects in all oh, people of the North, all oh, the Nagas, you know, headhunters, uncivilized, yeah. what do they know? I mean, for heaven's sake, what do we know? Because mm. we've been messing up since the 1950s. Yeah. 
yeah. repeatedly and deliberately yeah. for the for the oddest of reasons. Sorry, yeah. Manoj. I mean, forgive me. I get you know I get a bit angry when I talk about this because no, I, it, it, I it think, just brings out that oil. Yeah. No, I think it's completely. I think it's completely understandable, and I think you you capture some of that frustration very well in the book also when you talk about some of these issues and how and you sort of talk about what you think India should be doing better. The Indian state should be doing better when I say India. But I want to sort of, you know, you talk about the fact that, you know, yes, these groups have, there'll be so many splinter groups that have come. And I remember that, and I can't remember which context it was, but there's a conversation in the book between you and an unidentified intelligence official where uh, he, uh, you know, there's a conversation about splintered groups. And there's, and I can't remember even which group it was, but there's a talk about, you know, where there are now 26 groups. And that's at least 26 yeah, yeah. known groups. Uh, so, you know, yeah. when you talk to people, whom do you talk to? Uh, and you sort of, talk yeah. about how this is a process of a policy of attrition that the Indian state ha yeah. has followed, uh, which you articulated when you said, you know, Sam, Dam, Dhan, yes. uh, that, that is essentially yes, uh, at the end indeed. of the, that's the idea of policy of attrition. Let's, let's come to this 2015 framework agreement, you know, um, and I was really keenly waiting to come to that part of the book when I was reading it, that, you know, I remember when the agreement was signed, uh, or at least when it was announced that the agreement was signed, and you do an excellent job of actually visualizing that in the text, you know, when you sort of talk mm -hmm. about uh, the entire scene that you set and, you know, uh, yeah. when Prime Minister Modi spoke and when Moya spoke and uh, others. Uh, so you do an excellent job in that. It's very descriptive. Thank you. And I remember Thank the you. fact that uh, there was very little information for years as to what the agreement entailed. You Indeed. Know, there was nothing in the public domain. And it even, and, but I remember when it was signed, there was a lot of information about, there was a lot of media coverage about how this is a breakthrough deal. And yet it's 2022, uh, we are still uh, no better than where we were, we're probably worse off. So I want to get your thoughts on that framework agreement because the agreement is uh, okay. there now. Uh, and why do you, why are you so critical of it? Was it, uh, you know, what were the limitations of the agreement and where do you see policy failures in the last six, seven years? I think that uh, Manoj, you know, one shouldn't dismiss the framework agreement out of hand and neither mm -hmm. did I, uh, mm -hmm. because by itself, a framework agreement, any agreement for peace is a darn good thing. I mean, for heaven's sake, peace is, is an aspirational thing. If there is conflict, there must be conflict resolution. It's for me QED. It's, it's, it has to happen. Otherwise, you just live in this perpetual sort of vicious circle of conflict. And also the conflict economy, which is its own strange animal, which feeds on itself and will never let go. It is sort of, it, it, is, it is a very hungry animal. It eats all the time. It eats development funds, it, it, it eats black uh, funds, it eats everything, and it, it impoverishes the very people it's supposed to enrich and empower and enlighten and enable. So that's a tragedy in, 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 a, in a sort of act one, scene two, if you will. But you know, the, the ceasefire agreement, the framework agreement for peace, was a, like, which is very typical for, this, uh, for the current administration, a, a, a ceremony of grand optics. This, this government thrives on on a sense of optics, which is fine. I mean, different governments have different value systems and different policy approaches. They're, they're welcome to it. I was critical about the framework agreement for peace for the optics and the theatrics without actually delving into which, you know, it was sort of saying, okay, uh, hum dek lenge. we'll see to it. Let's sign it. Let's create grand optics. Let's get a sense of a good goodwill going. And, you know, uh, the India government, India two, uh, uh, sorry, India one, uh, at that point, BJP led NDA 1 at the, at the time, now NDA 2, ha has done a grand job even in the Northeast. We've unknotted the, the most drastic of the Gordian knots in the Indian subcontinent, the longest running rebellion, and so on and so forth. Far from the truth. I mean, the framework agreement, to my mind, was rather hollow. And it, it was lack, uh, Manoj, on several counts. One, it was a sign, it, it was signed between the government of India and the one large faction of the rebels, National Council, Social Council of Naga Lim, I am Isaac Muiba. Isaac, Mr. Isaac was then in hospital. He died soon after he was unwell. Mr. Muiba was present with his, his senior colleagues and everybody in the room was from the prime minister's office. There was Rajnath Singh as, as the home minister. There was the chief of army staff, General Suhar over there. There was Mr. Muiba and his groups. There were lots of people from the intelligence bureau and there were tons of bureaucrats and PMO people, but there was not a single civil society person, no church leader, no uh, representation from the people of Nagaland, Manipur, Arunachal, and Assam. There was nothing. It was just a 
the, this is like a scripted show between the PMO and the, the national security establishment and the largest Naga rebel group, right? So how can you bring peace when you don't involve the people, number one? Number two, you don't involve the other Naga rebel groups. How do you bring peace to the Naga rebellion or the Naga rebel process? If you just talk to one faction, they could be the largest faction, but cumulatively the others add up to something too, right? You, you're not involving the Naga people. The Naga, the chief minister of Nagaland was not in the room. And forget the chief minister of Manipur, Arunachal and Assam. The chief minister of Naga land, the one state in India with Naga to its name, was not part of the Naga peace process and has never been from 1960 onwards. It has always been the government of India. See, my decibel level is gone up. It has always been uh, with the government of India and, and the security establishment and the rebel rebels of the day. What about the civil society? It's always been the sort of unifocal binary talk between the two. You don't get peace when you don't talk 360 degrees. One of I mean, that is the first rule of thumb of con conflict resolution and has been so for thousands of years. You include everybody, otherwise it doesn't work. You include the stakeholders. So that was that is a flaw. The second flaw I described is you know not getting the others on board. The third flaw was not talking about what the agreement was all about. And I maintained from day one, from 3rd of August 2015, when the agreement was signed at Seven Racecourse Road, that this is a hollow agreement. It's a fraud perpetrated on the people of India and the people of Nagaland and people of Northeastern India, and is essentially an agreement for an agreement. That's what the framework is. So, and that has been proven subsequently. Now, in 2017, the, I mean, by then, the, you know, sort of the cat had been belled and the light penny had dropped and the tube light had come on and all of that. And if I, as a humble analyst, historian, writer, journalist, can figure this one out, surely the mandarins in, you know, the prime minister's office and the research and analysis group of the cabinet secretariat and the Ministry of External Affairs and the Ministry of Defense and the NSA's office and for heaven's sake, thousands of well-qualified people in, in security and foreign policy affairs should be able to figure it out as well. And, I mean, it's a no-brainer, right? And um, so anyway, it all clicked in and you had Mr. R.N. Ravi, who was appointed to the locutor. And Mr. Ravi is a, was a good person, in my opinion, to be there because he actually knows the Northeast. And, you know, he's, he, he's been posted there and he's in his own way, very sympathetic and more importantly, empathetic to the Northeast. Uh, there's no arrogance towards the Northeast in that manner, whatever for other faults he might carry with him. He understands the region extremely well. So then things began to roll on and more groups came on board in a parallel framework. Naturally, the IM faction got upset because, you know, they suddenly found themselves diminished because they were not the only game in town. They were never the only game in town, but government of India in its sort of ridiculous, questionable wisdom uh, decided to make them the only game in town. So for them to climb down was a loss of face. You see how what I'm getting at, that we've created, Geo has yeah. created problems for itself. So yeah. then factions come on board, then the civil society gets spoken to. Then in 2017, 2018, 2019, an outreach begins to happen from the NDS superstructure outwards when the M MPs and MLAs of the BJP in Northeastern India begin to approach their colleagues in other parties and other mm -hmm. states to say that, look, can we come to a solution? And then a solution begins to take shape. Mm -hmm. And there are very good suggestions, Manoj, and we must uh, acknowledge them. Even mm -hmm. though it is easy to trash the framework agreement, what yeah. evolved into solutions is laudatory. It's very good. For instance, the absorption of the demobilization of the Naga rebel arm, right? There's like in Nepal, like in other conflicts of India and other parts of the world, certain group of uh, cadres get absorbed into in those, you know, paramilitary forces or even the army, uh, in some cases in Nepal, for instance, uh, and some get retrained, they get rehabilitated, they get in, they get bank loans, they for a new life. The leadership is absorbed into the political structure, pretty much like the Mizo National Front in Mizoram in 1986, where remarkably a Congress Chief Minister Lalta Nawala actually mm -hmm. stepped down mm -hmm. to give the rebel leader Mr. Laldenga the Chief Minister's post. Now, who has the depth of courage and political wisdom and foresight 
as the Mizo people did in 19, back in 1986, at a time when Rajiv Gandhi, who's pilloried for so many things, actually oversaw a, a peace process that is held to this day. Mm. You know, this, let's hold up credit where, this, where, where it's due. So then there were other proposals, like in Nagaland, there's a proposal for uh, to make the Nagaland, which is a unicameral state legislature, to make it a bicameral two-house legislature, which would absorb more rebel leadership into an MLA structure, if you will. Yeah. Right? There's talk of delimitation de in the constituencies in Nagaland and Manipur and other states, which would increase the size of the legislature, yeah. uh, numeric demographically and numerically. There are many other things, including uh, giving socks for development to the Naga people here, so that they don't have any reason to demand this greater Naga homeland, which is yeah. a tricky issue, and yeah. are content with the developments offered to them within the structure of the states they now are in. Right. You see, so th there is a lot of give and take. But in Manipur, for instance, over and above this, you know, the, what about the majoritarian Manipuri people, the Metis, or the non-Naga people of Manipur? What yeah. do they get in return for greater autonomy in the Naga homelands in territorial Manipur? The right. government of India hasn't thought that through yet. Yeah. Uh, to my mind, a no-brainer would be massive amounts of development hmm. to truly make Manipur a gateway state, to massively clamp down on corruption, which government of India and its cohorts have perpetuated, and successive governments of both the Congress and the BJP in Manipur hmm. have perpetuated. Get yeah. rid of that. Lead to real development. Third, get rid of a contentious act and a hugely problematic Security Act, like the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, 1958, we'll, we'll, or we'll, we'll, for short. We'll, we'll, we'll come to that, and that's going to be my next question. But mm. before that question, I'm going to take a mm. quick break, and then we'll come back. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got two more questions to which I'm going to get quick answers from Sudeep. These are complicated questions. Quick answers are difficult. Uh, but I've got two more questions about the uh, Armed Forces Special Powers Act and uh, the CAA, the Citizenship Amendment Act, uh, and we'll address both of those in the final bit of this conversation. Namaste, this is Cyrus Brocha. I am part of the government cancel culture program to remove rubbish off all the different streams available. So what we have is all the collected rubbish we put together on our show. It's called Cyrus Says. It's on IVM podcast. You have to watch it and listen to it. It's on our app. It's on our website. It's on the YouTube channel. It's on Facebook. There are many different ways. Don't bother me and ask me how uh, you have to find out. We talk to different personalities. Many of them are known. Some are just people we meet downstairs and invite them up for chai. But the point is, it's fun and it's very therapeutic. So please join in and listen to Cyrus Says. Hello and welcome back to All Things Policy. I'm Manoj Keval Ramani and we've been in conversation with Sudeep Chakravarti talking about his new book, The Eastern Gate. We've just had a very, very detailed discussion about some of the conflicts and specifically uh, the conflict with regard to the Nagas in India's Far East. And we were coming to the point where we were talking about the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. And so the, that's, that's my sort of, I have two more questions for you and I'm, you know, I'm hoping that we can do, this is a complicated issue, but I'm hoping that we can do this in the next 10 minutes. Uh, is firstly, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this has been a really, really contentious issue for decades on end. And in December, we saw another incident in Nagaland which led to the death of people and which then again led to this committee being formed uh, under the Union Home Ministry to look at uh, the potential withdrawal of the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. The committee's time has elapsed, it's got an extension, and it doesn't seem like anything's going to come of it. And it, this seems like an issue which, you know, is persistent, yet there is no real answer. And sort of, before we started recording, I was talking to you and I was telling you, you know, in my perception, in public perception, it seems like it's a very difficult sort of intractable situation, you know, or do you remove the act and then regret uh, because there is still militancy, there is still violence, there is still rebels, or do you not remove the act and still then perpetuate all of those problems which are anyway going to remain there? So it seems like a chicken and egg situation. And you said you don't agree with that. So I want to sort of hear your view on this. No, because Manoj, because it is not a chicken and egg situation. It is a chicken and egg situation that is made out to be by chest thumping policy dons who are backed by chest thumping armed forces uh, dons and uh, generals and, and strategists in the, of the security arena who, who insist that AFSPA is needed. Now, you know, let me begin with one very quick example. I mean, I've given talks in Mao some years ago, the Army College of War, and I discussed AFSPA with, with the Army in the Lion's Den, if you will, in the Army War College in Mao. 
And here, you know, the, the general who was a commandant, who was a command, com commandant of Mao, he actually said, you know, if you don't want Afspa, then don't invite the army there. But if you invite the army, you have to give the army a prophylactic to cover it because, you know, you're essentially transforming a police action into an army action. Yeah. You can't, do, his, his, his suggestion was that, you know, you politic, he didn't say it, I'm saying it, and let me not put words in his mouth, let me say it myself. You are putting, uh, taking a law and order situation, a bureaucratic, a misgovernance situation, and you let it snowball into a conflict. Then you send in the army because you can't deal with it yourself. Then the army says, you know, we are a sledgehammer. They're not into, you know, you don't have SEAL Team 4 all over the world. That kind of thing that you go in and do precision attacks in the 1940s, 50s and 60s. You do a broad based sledgehammer move. You don't care because you've got orders from on high to protect Bharat Mata and his territory. You do what it takes and you do ugly things. That's what, and then you need AFSPA to protect you from legal action for all the atrocities that you've committed. Now, that's where it began, and that has still remained, Manoj, all through all these decades in the minds of the people of northeastern India. And also, let me say, a cousin exists in, in Jammu and Kashmir, the now Union territory of Jammu and Kashmir. There is a cousin of Afspa in Kashmir as well, which we tend to forget. Now, okay, very quickly. So the fact, I mean, the, the statement that Afspa is necessary and um, it, nothing can happen without AFSPA, and if you take AFSPA away, everything will collapse, is a complete fallacy and is disinformation and misinformation and spin doctoring of the highest order, which has been proven over and over by government commissions like the Justice Jeevan Reddy Commission, the Justice Hegde Commission, and also people like Mr. Ravi, RN Ravi, the, the recent Naga interlocutor who's been on record saying you don't need AFSPA. Someone like Ranjit Shekhar Mushahari, who actually was BSF chief and headed the NSG and was the governor of Meghalaya, went in public at a police conference in Shillong and said, you don't need AFSPA, please remove AFSPA, right? Uh, so these are people who've said it and the government has always chosen to ignore it, okay? Now, the conflict wherever has lessened in the Northeast has not lessened on account of imposition of AFSPA. It is lessened on account of regional, political, and geopolitical realities. Pakistan provided refuge to many rebel groups which emanated from India. Pakistan went into Bangladesh, support dropped. When a hardline governments of General Zia and General Ashraf and Khalida Zia came into Bangladesh, the rebels got shelter. Ever since Sheikh Hasina has been the prime minister of uh, Bangladesh, those shelters have disappeared. Rebels from Assamese rebels to other rebels and Manipuri rebels have been handed over to the security establishment of India literally on a platter for a sense of goodwill. Myanmar has clamped down on rebel havens and refuges in, uh, in, in Myanmar because of bilateral talks and agreements with India, right? And the economies of these states have grown forward. The, the, the target audience, the TG, the target group, if you will, to use a marketing term, of the rebel groups have diminished over time because the, the, you know, things like right to information has kicked in. There has been actual socioeconomic development, not just with this government in Delhi, but with successive governments of India from the 80s onwards, 90s onwards, since liberalization, that has transformed the, in many places and geographies and aspirations of the people of Northeastern India, the same as other parts of India. So things have moved on. So the rebels have seen diminishing logic and the people have seen diminishing returns to the rebel infrastructure. So that has led to the, uh, to the diminishing of conflict. Now, ironically, Nagaland, state from 1963, as we speak, has AFSPA applied all across Nagaland, but it's been a state since 1963. There yeah. is no conflict in Nagaland, yeah. but because it is there, you have trigger happy uh, security uh, uh, forces who react in a particular way, and then, they go berserk because you know they're panicky, right? Yeah. In in Tripura, Man Manoj in Tripura, case study in lifting of Afspa. Tripura had Afspa. Mm. Tripura lifted Afspa several years ago because, mm. and they have not had an issue since because mm. Tripura decided that Afspa is an impediment, yeah. a northeastern state with raging rebellions, with multiple rebel groups, with refuge in Myanmar and. Bangladesh and former East Pakistan, 
and so on and so forth have decided that has decided for the sake of prosperity, peace and prosperity in the future, they can do without AFSPA. All it needs yeah. is to reach out to the indigenous population, the Tripuri population, the residents of Tripura, and talk, be sought out, and be inclusive, and look to the future together. That's yeah. all you need, Manoj. Yeah. So it's been proven in the Northeast. So yeah. why in Manipur? Why yeah. in Nagaland? And, yeah. and the, AFSPA doesn't exist across Assam except along yeah. a, uh, like a strip along Meghalaya. Arunachal Pradesh is like Aspa is in a few pockets. Yeah. So why do these uh, vast geographies live and survive and thrive without Aspa? And the security establishment insists that you, you need Aspa in Manipur and Nagaland. It's bizarre and it's completely yeah. unfathomable. Yeah, I mean, the, the hardest thing to do for peace yeah. is to let Manipur do away with Aspa, lift Aspa, and you will get peace. I think if you lift AFSPA, you can truly be able to reclaim even your right in yeah. northeastern India as GOI and the Republic of India. Lift it and yeah. see what how people embrace it, how yeah. people celebrate it. I mean, at the heart of it is that we've converted a political problem into a security problem. At the end of it, the answer has to come out from yes. politics. My yes. final question to you is about the politics of the region. And, you know, uh, it's sort of linked to obviously uh, what's happening. But the rise of the BJP as a yes. player in that part of the country and, you know, the Citizenship Amendment Act, the controversy around that over the last couple of years, along with the National Register of Citizens, you know, does this, does the rise of the BJP, BJP uh, as a major player in that region or an emerging player in that region in some ways, does it sort of, and obviously a major player at the union level, does that sort of create more opportunities because you have potentially a single party government uh, at the union level, but also uh, a, gov in a party which is gaining traction in that uh, part of the region? Uh, or does its brand of politics, uh, you know, religious nationalism, cultural nationalism, whatever one may call it, uh, does that add a new layer of complexity to these conflicts? Indeed. And indeed, in fact, the laboratory of CAA, Manoj, and the laboratory of NRC, which has then been sought to be templated across India, but, I mean, it hasn't happened. But if it has happened in one state, both things have happened in one state. It is Assam. People don't realize that Assam is the laboratory for CAA and NRC. Everything goes back to Assam, the, 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 the application of CAA, the, the application of NRC, the courts and the, the quarreling into uh, these camps of people who don't make the grade is all in Assam, right? And because of the domination of the BJP over the past two successive electoral uh, cycles in that state, first led by uh, Mr. Sonowal or Honowal, and then his understudy, who was actually the power center, who is actually the, the leader, the, the chief, chief uh, laboratory, laboratory technician for the Sung construct and the BJP construct in Assam, is Himanta Bhisasarma, who is the chief minister of Assam as we speak, right? Now, he uh, and his colleagues in the BJP, they basically spearhead this project. I mean, he's ensuring, they're ensuring that Assam remains the crucible and the laboratory for religious and ethnic nationalism uh, or Indian nationalism in, in, in the Northeast. Uh, uh, Assam is a vanguard of it. Uh, and, and, and that project is evident. Uh, the other state where this is very, very successful, successful to the next degree is Tripura because of this vast population of uh, Bengalis who are now citizens of Tripura because of migrating from Bengal and what was from formerly East Pakistan and then Bangladesh on account of several purges and riots and so on and so forth, where an uh, indigenous Tripuri population has been swamped and now Tripura is 70% Bengali. Now, which is, which is the audience that the BJP and the, uh, the Sang Parivar, as it's called, has targeted, much like in Assam, for its project of ethnic and religious nationalism, for, for its religious nationalism, let me put it that way, or political nationalism. The other area where they've tried it very hard is in, uh, is in Manipur, the non-tribal, the non-Naga, non maiti aspects of Manipur, which is basically Imphal Valley, which accounts for 40 assembly seats out of the 60, and accounts for about uh, 20, 80 percent of uh, the population of Manipur, or uh, sorry, 60%, uh, yeah, 70 to 60% of the, two thirds of the population of Manipur, even though it accounts for about 10% of the land area of Manipur. 
So that is a concentration where the Sangh Parivar and the BJP have concentrated their uh, experiments in uh, religious nationalism and, and majoritarian nationalism, right? Which is also why, Manoj, where they can't do the Naga peace deal because they have to assuage the Maiti vote bank. So through two election cycles, the BJP government has been not been able to solve the Naga peace process, even though they're in New Delhi and they're in Imphal, and they're in coalition partnership in Kohima, because they have to pander to their vote bank in uh, Imphal Valley. <laughs> so it's, it's a problem they've created on their own. So it is an extremely disturbing development, Manoj, this thing. I am truly concerned because uh, this is cynical, very, very cynical politics. I mean, there's no such thing as non-cynical politics in any case, but this is truly supremely cynical, where I believe that the security, the, the, the population, ethnic, social, economic, and strategic security, security in true blue words, of India and Northeastern India is under immense threat because this is a region that is ethnically complex. It is also directly related to the effects of migration related to climate change. It is a seething cauldron of religious sort of shape shifting. And here you go and play nationalistic politics in, a, uh, in this borderlands of India, in this geopolitical sweet spot of India, which you claim is a bridgehead and the gateway to Southeast Asia. And is a, it is a fulcrum pivot to your look east policy, act east policy. What the hell are they talking about? It, yeah. is a, uh, it is a confusion and a cynical political play, a pure the, the jumla, you know, uh, the, the, the political play and the political promise making, uh, mixed up with all kinds of promises being made all the time without any solution at hand. I truly despair for my brothers and sisters of Northeastern India. And forget right. the integrity. With the integrity with the Republic of India. Let's yeah. begin with our concern for the people who have been yeah. taken for a ride all these decades and continue to be taken for a ride yeah. to this day. And, yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think it's, uh, you've really painted a, you know, it's a really, it's a really dire picture and it's a really urgent thing that we need to be addressing. It's a really important sort of issue. And you also painted the picture of how difficult it has been for so many reasons, not just for you know, the ethnic diversity, the history, but also for the political reasons and the evolving politics of India currently. So Deep, thank you so much for this conversation. This has been fascinating. I really recommend that people go out and pick up the book, The Eastern Gate, uh, War and Peace in Nagaland, Manipur and India's Far East. For me, it was an education in understanding and approaching the region and trying to sort of contextualize this rich, diverse uh, and difficult history and also obviously the political implications of what's happening today. Uh, thank you so much, Sadiq. My pleasure, Manoj. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be talking to you and your listeners. Thank you very much. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at Takshashila INST or our website takshashila.org.in. Hey everybody, it's been another great week on the IBM Podcast Network. On this round is on me, Gauri has a conversation on building a sustainable luxury travel ecosystem with entrepreneur Jaisal Singh. On the wire talks, that asks American philosopher Jason Stanley to decode his book, How Fascism Works, The Politics of Us and Them. On the longest constitution, Priya explains the concept of invisible work and how Javed Akhtar and the copyright law are connected. On Postcards from Nowhere, Utsav tells us an interesting story that connects West Indies cricket, jackals, and Mariam in temples. And on All Things Policy, the Takshashila folk look into the Ukraine-Russia conflict and its associated geopolitics. So, on a personal note, I wanted to let you all know that this week marks the 7th anniversary since I started IBM. I'm eternally grateful to the team we have here, especially Kavita Rajwade and Teja Sringarpure, who have been here since the beginning. They've seen the struggles, our eventual acquisition by Pratilipi, and our continued struggles to make podcasting a large and thriving part of the media industry. We have the best hosts in the world, 
And I have to say that I'm so glad and so grateful that they have chosen to work with us. And finally, I'd like to say thank you to you, the millions of folks that have heard or watched our content. All I can say is you ain't seen nothing yet. I hope you join us as we continue this journey. In the meanwhile, do follow us on social media. We're IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And remember, if you're enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter, please do tell a friend. Also, don't forget to rate us on any platform you're listening to. You can also check us out on YouTube. Get a list of all of our channels. You can go to ivmpodcast.com slash YouTube, where you can go to all the channels. And finally, we'd like to thank our sponsors this week, SBI Life Insurance, Bank of Baroda, Max Life Insurance, India Water Portal, and HDFC Life Insurance. Thank you so much for making this possible if you're a cricket fan check out edges and sledges india's favorite cricket podcast the podcast focuses on indian cricket the ipl and has a ton of banter both on and off the field we talk about the week's biggest cricket stories with current and ex-international cricketers coaches or sometimes just between us and it's hosted by me dj me varun and me ashwin new episodes release every week you can catch us on the IVM Podcast website, app, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Check out the Edges and Sledges Cricket Podcast.